this uh, IIC webinar series. Good evening to all of you in India and a very good morning to our today's speaker, Professor Clark P. Gray. Uh, so I will give a brief background about this webinar series. Uh, so during the pandemic, as you know, we are passing through some extraordinary difficult time. We have many, many challenges. Uh, and one of the major challenges is how to keep students and faculties are intellectually or academically engaged. So we, uh, me and my colleague, Professor Jyotisma Das Gupta in TIFR Mumbai, uh, strongly felt we should begin a series of tutorial talk by using this uh, virtual platform. Through this webinar series, uh, we hope to bring a leading expert like Professor Clark Bay today uh, from around the world as well as I, in India, who believes uh, disseminating research ideas to tutorial style of talks. So this is very necessary uh, for an experimental heavy field uh, research subjects like in chemistry. The hope is that uh, with such talks uh, once in a month, we will learn the subject complexities uh, and forefront research ideas in a scholarly manner. So with this brief background, uh, let me once again welcome Professor Clark Gray to this webinar series. Uh, and I now invite uh, Professor Nagafani, my colleague in ISC, uh, to invite, uh, you know, to introduce Professor Clark. Pla okay. Over to you, Fani. Uh, thank you, Satish. Um, so it's, an, uh, it's a privilege to be introducing Professor Claire Gray um, for this talk series here. Um, so uh, just a formal introduction before I add a, a, a couple bits from my side. So Professor Claire Gray is the Jeffrey Moorhouse Gibson Professor in Materials Chemistry at the University of Cambridge. She is a world-renowned expert and a pioneer in the application of NMR to energy materials. I think it's, it's, it's probably not an overstatement if I say that she really um, is, um, started this entire field of NMR for energy materials. Uh, in particular, her research group uses NMR to study rechargeable lithium-ion batteries related energy materials, and also to study phase transitions in uh, related materials such as transition metal compounds. And I think her um, dream is to put NMR uh, to use in coming up with new energy storage materials so that they ultimately benefit environment. Uh, I'd say her contributions are critical to the development of NMR methodology to monitor structural changes um, uh, during the operation of a battery, investigate the effects of local structure, and also electronic properties on uh, the lithium ion battery performance. Um, I would say, Prof, uh, yeah, so uh, for this wonderful work, one thing that I would like to add is I think it spawned not just uh, NMR in general, but now there is a lot of researchers who are applying MRI to even study batteries. And I would say uh, the seeds uh, have been sown by Prof. Grace Research. Uh, and uh, for her pioneering contributions, uh, Professor Grace uh, is, is an extremely well-decorated uh, scientist, but to pick a few awards, Professor Grace Research, uh, she uh, was awarded with the Gunther uh, Lockean Prize, uh, hopefully I'm spelling it right, in 2013 um, for her pioneering research in NMR methods uh, as applied to battery materials, the Davy Medal of the Royal Society in 2014, the Hughes Medal of RSC uh, in 2020, and she is also a recipient of the Kavli Medal and the Lecture Prize uh, for essentially for her work uh, in NMR methods to um, battery materials. Uh, uh, a couple things that I would like to add um, is uh, very early on in my career, um, I met Professor Gray giving a talk um, on NMR methods. Um, uh, and then I, I will say in that, uh, in, in general, uh, I don't want to belittle anyone, but in general, if you want to go, if you go to a battery talk, most talks will focus on a material, show some galvanostatic curves and say this material, material is better than something uh, before. But after I heard Professor Gray's talk, it was extremely refreshing and it showed the mechanistic aspects of what is happening, um, uh, I would say locally in uh, a battery material. Uh, and, and I would say, I, I think when you understand something fundamentally, you can create things that are new. And uh, her research, uh, probably uh, what I really liked is now uh, Professor Gray is a founder of, uh, or a co-founder of a company called Niobolt, looking at um, fast charging techniques um, or fast charging lithium ion batteries. I think she's the coolest woman founder of UK. And uh, to, just to conclude, I would say, she's probably the coolest battery researcher that I met earlier in my career. With that, uh, uh, Professor Gray, over to you. 
Well, thank you, um, Fanny. Well, it's a really nice accolade and it's going to be really difficult to live up to that, but I will do my best. So um, just to um, to say what I want to try and do in these two talks. So first of all, I, you know, it's, it's a real honour to be here, um, well, at least virtually and hopefully physically at some point as we move forward to, 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 to describe our NMR work to you. And I'm you know, going to give two talks today, a little bit more hardcore NMR, and tomorrow a little bit more on applications, but I'm gonna try and weave both through my talks. And so hopefully be happy to answer lots of questions afterwards if I've gone too fast or I've glossed over some important details. Um, so let me just get my act together. So um, basically I want to, and I want to sort of bring out various themes uh, as I go forward. I just quickly wanted to remind people why we're doing this because it's of course a general audience talk for people who don't just work in batteries. And we're doing this because of transport, trying to make cheaper, safer, longer lasting batteries, primarily to reduce CO2 um, and use a diversity of fuels. And then the biggest challenge really is storage on the grid. And that's really one that we need to find a way to solve and we need to find ways to make batteries that are cheaper and more sustainable that push over towards higher um, energy density so that they can start to have impact for st storage beyond just frequency regulation or short-term backup. So, you know, this is a massive global challenge. And I think this one that you know, everybody should participate on that requires engineering, but also very fundamental science. And that's the, that's the exciting point for many of us. And again, um, I first um, met Fanny, particularly in when we were doing lithium air projects. And I think one point to sort of stress is that we are very close to the theoretical limits of, of the current day batteries. In other words, there's only so many lithium ions you can pull out of a material, whether it's this material nickel manganese cobalt layered structures. And so you need to really think about different ways of getting higher energy density. Costs have come down dramatically. They're now at about 100 kilowatt hours. Uh, dollars per kilowatt hours, but um, still they need to come down lower if we're going to be able, all be able to afford to drive electric vehicles of some sort, whether they're electric scooters to to rickshaws to um, to, to to buses and, and, and um, larger um, lorries. So again, this all has to be done in the context of sustainability, and that's something that really interests me. And you sort of look at the massive numbers of predictions for gigafactories and how much cobalt and how much nickel is going to be needed for all of this and the sort of numbers quoted for these gigafactories are consistent with the whole of the production in the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that itself has challenges in how that mining is done. And even lithium, which in, in principle is plentiful, uh, even though one does need to think about recycling, there are questions about how that is mined. And this is mined in, in this location in Chile, uh, from these brines and so you pump water out of these salt lakes and that has implications on the the fauna so these are the flamingos that um, that breed and feed from these lakes and of course the people that live around them have consequences because of the water and so this then motivates much more longer term research to think about how we how we do energy storage and conversion in increasingly more sustainable ways and I think um, you know, particularly the audience in India has a good sense about this as well in the context of of what we need to do. So just to sort of touch on um, in terms of just to put people in perspective in, in terms of the materials I'm going to talk about, a lot of what I'll talk about is, is this material um, lithium nickel oxide, which is a derivative of lithium cobalt oxide, you know, the original material um, I introduced and pioneered by John Goodenough. And that's being used because we're trying to get rid of cobalt, we're trying to reduce price, but we're also trying to get um, more higher energy densities. Um, the problem with going all to, to all lith towards all lithium nickel oxide, even though it's, it can be a higher rate material and higher energy density is it's not very stable, particularly as you go to higher temperatures and it's delithiated. And so the aim of the game is to introduce just the right amount of other elements that stabilize it. And you can do this with manganese four plus and create these uh, so-called NMC materials where you're mixing a combination of cobalt and manganese to get the oxidation state right. And cobalt, because it's uh, D6, likes to be layered. Uh, and then the other one is to try and put aluminium, again, um, to stabilize the system. So I'll talk about some of these materials as I walk through my talks for the next couple of days. So 
as I said in the first talk, I really want to ask the question, how can magnetic resonance methods contribute to battery research? And I'll try and answer that question by looking at uh, the characterization of some starting materials and then materials as they're cycled both in situ and ex situ. So in situ means of the whole intact battery, ex situ means that we're taking batteries apart and looking at them. And where I started off this work now many, many years ago and it actually spun out from something I did as a PhD student. So those of you who sometimes think, what am I doing as a PhD student? Is this relevant? Some of the science I learned then is still applicable now and um, is to look at paramagnetic materials. So I want to start with that story then to tell a little bit about um, how that's evolved in terms of because of both methodology and also understanding, talk about lithium mobility and then touch on some new areas that we've been trying to push in the last um, even just couple of years. So the dynamic nuclear polarization methods and then a redox flow. And then, um, as I said in my second talk, focus a little bit more on using these methods often in combination with different techniques because you, know, you need a framework coming from diffraction and other characterization methods to, to to frame your understanding of the system. And I'd like to talk, uh, introduce some new optical methods, which I think are quite interesting, developed in collaboration with a, a colleague of mine. Okay, so let's just sort of step back to where we were um, now almost um, 25 years ago. This was the work of my first PhD student um, in back in Stony Brook when I was a PI there. Um, called uh, Yongju Li, who with my first ever PhD student, Francis Wang, started to look at lithium ion batteries in collaboration with a, a battery scientist from Duracell, Bill Bowden. And so these are the lithium NMR spectra of spinels. So this is very familiar structure to most of you where lithium sits in a tetrahedral site surrounded by in the manganese spinel a mixed manganese three and manganese four plus. And this is a whole story in itself that I'd be happy to talk about if, if there are questions, but I just put this slide up to illustrate some, a few simple points. And the simple point, first of all, is that lithium has two spin active nuclei. There's lithium six and lithium seven. So lithium seven is the more abundant nucleus. It's a spin three halves. It means it's a quadrupolar nucleus and it has about 93% natural abundance. It's a higher gyromagnetic ratio. So it means that the Boltzmann um, magnetization is higher than the lithium-6, and so its sensitivity is higher. And so you contrast that to lithium-6, which has only a 7% natural abundance. It's a lower gyromagnetic ratio, but it's also got a smaller quadrupole coupling. And so what you're looking at here is a magic angle spinning spectrum. So I'll, I'll touch about touch on this in the next slide, where I'm spinning it at 10, 10 kilohertz. And because you're going from lithium six to lithium seven, this is a higher field, you can see at the same spinning speed, you've got an overlap of the central transition, which is shown here. And these are the spinning sidebands that come from the magic angle spinning. And so as I spin faster, the sidebands move, but the central band stays in the same place if the material is at the same temperature. And so let's just unpick what those spectra have told us. So there are two types of mechanisms that you would see in these NMR spectra of paramagnetic ions. So the large one that causes these spinning sidebands is called the dipolar interaction. And so this is the coupling that you would have between a lithium, for example, and another nuclear spin, or it could be another paramagnetic spin. And so in this case, it would be the manganese three plus and the manganese four plus. And that's a dipolar interaction and it operates with exactly the same mathematics as you would use to describe the interaction between two bar magnets. And importantly, it has a geometric dependence that depends on the relative orientation of the internuclear or inter um, spin vector and the magic angle field. And at three cosine squared theta minus one, uh, it, when theta is 54 degrees, that interaction is actually zero. And that's why we use this technique, magic angle spinning, where we spin our rotors very fast or as fast as possible at that magic angle to result in, if we spin fast enough to get rid of it totally, if we spin at these moderate spinning speeds, what we end up is getting these series of spinning sidebands separated by that magic angle spinning frequency. So what you're seeing here is this, the, the manifestation of this dipolar coupling from the lithium and the manganese. Uh, in there also is the quadrupole interaction, which is also to first order removed by magic angle spinning. Claire, Claire can you ask a question? Just to yeah, of course. In the previous, in the previous uh, slide, um, the lithium-6 spectrum has a very nice uh, 
spectral signatures all there but the lithium 7 it you're just saying that the spinning sidebands overpower the other signatures around 507 ppm yeah so what's happening is this spinning sideband is sitting right on top of that and so oh, okay okay everything is 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 obscured basically and uh, what what we can do now is we can move beyond 10 kilohertz and I'll show you in the next few slides as we're spinning at 60 kilohertz and we can spread everything out what well, what about what about these features if i can uh, point out in this um diagram in it this one for example this part these part they're all sim similar symmetric right yeah i didn't know you're going to be able to mutilate your slide my slides hopefully no, i'm sorry no, yeah. that's, i'm that is fine that's absolutely no the, these are this is the central transition and this is the sideband of that so this is the, the sideband of okay that one and so each of them contains signatures of the local environment and and since this is not part of my talk the spinel compounds what it's actually quite interesting it's the lithium here and it sees the different uh, electronic structures of the manganese around it and it turns out that when you have these types of materials they they aren't stoichiometric lithium manganese oxide some lithium ends up getting doped into this octahedral site changes the oxidation state of the lithium and so it's actually seeing lithium near manganese 4 plus and so this is the whole, you know the story that took us many years to work out what it meant but for the moment what i what i just yeah, sure it's just an example yeah that's right it's a local structure and it's telling you something about the electronic arrangement around there and now we need to basically unpick what it's telling you but first of all we need to be able to acquire spectrum so that you get something that looks beautiful like this where you can resolve it and here right. here you're you know it's being obscured sure thanks but i mean please um very happy if people um interject um so so this is the point i was trying to make is that we were originally using these these um smaller sorry these larger rotors and then as we move to these smaller ones we can spin faster and faster pull the side bands out and get better resolution and that's allowed us to now do lithium 7 nmr while as previously we were having to do lithium 6 to get those nicely resolved spectra so the dipolar interaction contains information it contains information about the spatial arrangement of the lithium and the paramagnetic ions and we've used that in some studies to to get information the thing that i want to focus on first though is this so-called fermi contact shift and this is a measure of how much unpaired spin density as at your as is at your paramagnet moves through the bonds and ends up at your lithium and this is the thing that contains a sort of direct chemical and electronic information because you can look at it you can write a hamiltonian uh, for this interaction and it's basically proportional to a hyperfine interaction times the um expectation value of sz or the or the magnetization the average magnetization pointing in in the z direction which is proportional to the susceptibility and so that's how you connect electronic structure of your paramagnet through to um the what we measure but we do this via the hyperfine interaction so that's the piece we next need to understand so let's now just jump forward um 20 20 25 years and put this in context of the materials we're looking at now and the project i want to talk about is one of the Far coming from the faraday institution uh, where i lead the the project on battery degradation and so where our focus is to understand how batteries degrade and hopefully stop that and we do that by looking at lots of using lots of different techniques and of course we're not the ones applying all these different techniques it's done with all of our partners across the uk um but i'm going to focus a little bit about the nmr of these materials and the materials we studies study of is this material nmc811 so that stands for 80% nickel 10% manganese 10% cobalt and it's in a full cell which means we compare it against graphite and the reason we're studying it is is it that's the battery that's going into next generation electric vehicles so let's just unpick that material a little bit more so if you think about the prototype lithium cobalt oxide there the cobalt is 3 plus and so we have to work out the charge balance and this material manganese um is e more easy to oxidize so it always ends up as manganese 4 plus that charge compensates with some nickel 2 plus so you reduce that down and the residual is nickel 3 plus so it's a mixed mixed valent compound okay so we're now moving forward we're still at these low fields because we're trying to minimize the sidebands because the the sidebands the higher the field the bigger the magnetic response the more sidebands so we're going to stay at low fields but we're going to spin a lot faster 
And um, we're actually going to use a two dimensional experiment, which I'll, I'll explain in my next talk. But for the moment, all you need to think about is that is actually going to get rid of the sidebands for you. And what you then see of this material, and instead of those nice discrete peaks that I showed you from the first example, is what could only be described as a horrible blob. But the main thing that I want to talk about with this blob is that it's got a very large shift from zero ppm. And lithium, if you would just had a diamagnetic compound, so something with no um, paramagnetic ions, has shifts that are a bit like protons. So they're all around zero ppm, so plus or minus uh, five ppm. And this large shift to much more positive frequencies is coming from this Fermi contact or hyperfine interaction. So remember, this is the transfer of spin density from the paramagnet through the bonds to the lithium. These are ex situ NMR, so it means that I take a battery, uh, and I say take, it was work done by Katerina Merka, who's a postdoc in my lab where she cycles with Chao Chu and Phil Reeves help to um, batteries to different states of charge. She pulls them apart, puts them in the rotor, does very fast magic angle spinning and gets these spectrum. So let's start by unpicking the spectrum of the starting material. So again, it's got nickel two plus, nickel three plus, and manganese four plus. And by studying over these years, uh, the NMR of paramagnetic materials, we've really um, developed a very detailed understanding of what causes the shifts. Clear, clear. Uh, there's a question. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting so I, you. So I, I can't see questions. So if, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so he will unmute. Aninda? Aninda? Professor Aninda Bhattacharya? Aninda, uh, could uh, you? Claire, this is Aninda. Uh, Hi, Aninda. Hi. So, uh, I hope I'm audible. And yes, yes, very yes. Audible. Yeah. So, uh, if I just go back to the previous slide, this variation of X. Yep. Uh, you're actually varying the, uh, so it's, it's variation in the, in, in the lithium one minus X. Yes. So, uh, with increase in lithium concentration, does it mean that you have a, you know, change from somewhat uh, uh, a liquid kind of thing to a more, uh, from a solid kind of thing to a more liquid kind of environment, if I read it correctly, uh, if I see go from X equal to zero. So, I mean, what, I, what uh, you're seeing here is just the lithium, uh, the, 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 I made a battery and I've got lithium um, nickel manganese okay. cobalt oxide in a battery and I'm disassembling okay. it and I'm looking at it. So this is X equals zero is here. And then I'm looking at different okay. states of charge. And so this is the fully charged one where I pulled out almost all of the lithium. And you can see that the lithium NMR spectra are changing dramatically as I pull the lithium out. And what I want to do now is to explain this, hopefully okay. coherently. Right. So yeah, will, I got your point. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it will hopefully make sense because there's, there's about two things that are going, or three things that are going on here. Um, yes. Yeah. So I have a question, Claire, with, the rem with regards to the spectra. The spectra shows a broadening and a shift. So yes. now, 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 um, uh, you could have populations under that broadened peak, which you are not accounting for. Um, and and uh, the, so the, to read out the shift would be uh, won't be a a little bit of a, a overinterpretation just to see how much it is shifted because you might have populations. Yeah. So so if you humor me and give me five minutes. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. The full answer to your question. So I think it's better if I just take it from the, the, the beginning. And then I think if it still isn't clear, then I really have done a bad job. So. Oh, no, no, clear. Okay, continue. <laughs> no, just give me give me two minutes to sort of explain it. So, you know, we have to in order to explain which you, you know, what you quite rightly point out is a featureless blob. We have to think about why it's a featureless blob. And that's because this lithium that's in a layer sees all of the different paramagnetic ions in the layer above and below. And so in the first coordination shell, which we call these sort of 90 degree interactions, you've got six, you've got three above and three below. And then in the second coordination shell with these 180 degree interactions, you've got another, you've got another six. And you've got a combination of nickel two plus, nickel three plus, manganese four plus, and cobalt three plus. And so for those of you who can remember your inorganic chemistry, nickel two plus is D8. So you've got two unpaired electrons in the EG orbital. Nickel three plus is D7, one. Manganese four plus is D3, so two, three in the T2G orbital. And so what we now need to say is how do they affect the shift? And so what we've done over a number of years is to use the arguments that use people use in magnetism to explain that. And we and sort of a nice elegant example, if people want to read about it, is we did this in a lithium cobalt oxide where we just doped in a very small amount of nickel and manganese. 
And so let me illustrate what we found was that when you had one manganese four plus in the first coordination shell, so this 90 degree interaction, we had a shift of plus 250. If it was 180, it was minus 60. So why is that? So let's think about what an interaction would look like in terms of the orbital. So I've got one electron in the T2G orbital. It overlaps directly with a 2P orbital, and that then overlaps with the lithium. And so for those of the inorganic chemists in the audience or the ones who are doing DFT, this is formerly the T2G star orbital in your um, ligand field stabilization theory. I have one electron in the manganese, in the manganese in this one orbital, I put a field on, I align it with the field, but then I can overlap in this orbital. This is a o- direct overlap of this orbital. And so as a result, um, the good, in the good enough Kananamari arguments, he would say, good enough would say, this means this orbit, the, the filled electron, uh, sorry, in, in the, the, the T2G would, would want to align in this direction because that's lowering it. And then this one in this direction, so you get a a positive spin density transfer. So that's the good enough argument. My argument is that you actually form a T2G star star orbital where you can transfer spin density directly via a delocalization mechanism. And so if we then use the same sort of arguments for um, manganese um, in a 180 degree interaction, this in some ways is easier, some ways easier to think about. So I'm now looking at the the EG orbital here. So this is an empty orbital. So it's the EG star orbital. And that's the one that's formed by interacting with a fill 2P. And so that's then, um, so as a chemist, we always think about an orbital, uh, one, one, for example, EG star orbital as just being a single orbital, but actually it's a, there are two one electron orbitals. There's one for the up electrons, there's one for the down electrons. And when you're in the presence of a field or in the presence of unpaired electrons, they no longer have to be the same. And so what you end up having is because of the exchange interaction, it's more favorable for the up electrons to drift in the direction of the, the, the manganese and the downs to drift in the direction of the lithiums. And so that results in a net transfer of negative spin density to the lithiums. And so um, the other formal way that the, the John Goodenough et al. would describe it is that you have an exchange interaction which favors the ups being together. And as a result, the, the negatives are further away. But the other way of saying it is this is just an EG star orbital with the ups and the downs having a slightly different linear combination of orbitals. So you have more up here and more down there. So the bottom line is, even if I haven't been very clear in explaining it, there is a rigorous basis for why you have a positive shift for manganese four plus and why you have a negative shift for um, 180 degree interactions. For nickel, it's sort of almost easier to think about this as a nickel two plus where you now have a filled EG orbital and now you can have a direct overlap and you can end up having a direct delocalization mechanism a bit like this, except it's now 180 and you get a positive shift. Okay, so that's quite sort of relatively straightforward to to see when you have these obvious linear combinations and 90 degrees and 180 degrees. We've also done a lot of work on um, first principle calculations, and this was really pushed by Derek Middlemas, a former postdoc in my lab, where he came up with some really nice methods of doing this. And so um, let me just illustrate what we do in a system with just lithium and nickel and oxygen. So this is the layered lithium nickel oxide. Here's a lithium, and these are all the nickel spins in the, the first and second coordination shells. So you can already see the complexity of the problem. And so what, in order to calculate this, you do a DFT calculation. Technically, we do these hybrid DFT um, calculations. So we have a bit of hartree fock and a bit of DFT around 20 to 35% um, to get that right. And we start off at zero Kelvin in the ferromagnetic structure, which means all of the spins are up and we calculate the hyperfine shift for this configuration. And then we just do something quite clever. We flip one spin and we calculate the hyperfine shift again. And then we take this, the difference between the all up and the all up minus the one down. And that, that gives us the individual shift or hyperfine interaction for this one pathway that we've just flipped. And so, for example, in this calculation, we've got a shift of um, 44 for this interaction. And um, this is a zero Kelvin calculation. And so now we need to move into room temperature where we're making the measurements 
And we do that by either scaling with the magnetic susceptibility data, or we do a full um, calculation of the magnetic couplings, and then we can use mean Foodle or Monte Carlo approach to bring it to room temperature. So I can, again, I can answer questions about that, but the bottom line is when you have complex structures, so this is an example of a yarn teller distorted lithium nickel oxide, for illustration purposes, we can, we can do these types of calculations. So now, finally, to answer your question, we can go back to our blobby spectrum and we can actually try and assign that spectrum. And so what Katerina did was to, to work out all of the configurations that this lithium would see in terms of the nickel two pluses, the nickel three pluses, and the manganese four pluses, the cobalts, the diamagnetic, and work out the shifts using these predicted shifts and generate a model. And she actually didn't get the, the right model. It was even too complicated and even broader. So she had to make another assumption. And that was that there was random, sorry, there was, there was a random distribution of transition metals, but more importantly, there were electron hopping between the nickel ions. And so instead of seeing nickel two plus and nickel three plus as individual species, she saw an average weighted by the relative amounts. And so she had to scale those appropriately when she did, she got a very good simulation of it. So, you know, that's inherent to these materials. They are just disordered. And so you're not going to get very straightforwardly better resolved spectra than that. But this one measurement tells you something that, you know, we sort of knew anyhow, but that there is very rapid hopping between the nickel two pluses and the nickel three pluses, which is another reason why these materials are good battery materials, because you not only have to get the lithium ions out of these structures, you've got to get the electrons out. So this is a, what's known as a hopping semiconductor. Can I ask here, Claire, again, um, yep. what is the time scale in which you are collecting the spectra? And uh, do, you, do you consider uh, diffusion of ions within that time scale? Uh, yes, that's my next point. Um, so just to sort of um, to talk about the time scale of this one, the um, hopping of the electrons we're measuring that at the time scale of the differences of the hyperfine interactions. And so just to sort of ballpark it, imagine you had six nickel two pluses, it would be six times 170, and the difference of nickel three plus is six times 110. So the time scale is, 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 is then PPM. So PPM is, is not a time scale, or you need to multiply it by the Lamo frequency. So these are kilohertz time scales that you, you're hopping in. So it's, it's faster than that, but those are the timescales that we're probing with this thing. Now, if we think about the lithium mobility, just you're gonna have to get, you're gonna have one more explanation and then I'm gonna answer that question. I just wanna sort of stay with thinking about the hyperfine interaction. So now let's go back to this uh, layered phase and we're gonna pull the lithium out. And what you notice is this sharpening. So that's the mobility part that I'll talk about. But then for some reason it gets broader again, but it's not as broad as the original one. And this is simply because we've oxidized all the nickel two plus and three plus to nickel four plus. Nickel four plus is low spin D6. Even if you weren't convinced it was low spin D6, the spectra tell you that. And what you're seeing are two better resolved, they're not brilliant, but they're better resolved peaks at the right position for either one manganese four plus in a 90 degree interaction or two manganese four plus. And so you've got this slight decrease in the overall hyperfine shift because of the oxidation of nickel two plus and three plus, and you've got these nicely resolved peaks at the top of charge. So then what's going on here? So in answer to that, those people who do NMR sort of know that when things start to sharpen up, the obvious culprit for that is lithium mobility. And you can obviously test if something is uh, mobile by doing variable temperature NMR. And so this is um, now the variable temperature NMR of, let's just sort of start with this component 0.25. It's still pretty broad, but we go up in temperature and you can see the spectrum narrows up very nicely. And so that's a really a clear signature of lithium mobility. So um, this is just to sort of also, um, I told you some, I told you a little bit about these complicated map pass experiments to uh, remove the spinning sideband. This, this gives you an illustration of where the sidebands are at these um, 60 kilohertz spectra. So you can see that we've spun fast enough so that the sidebands are not obscuring the main, the main resonances. And it's much more clear when, you're, when it's sharper because then you can see them better resolved. Okay, so when you're at point 0.1, you can see temperature doesn't make much difference. When you're at point 0.5, you're already sharp and it just sharpens everything up. So that's a clear signature of lithium 
Anything? Claire, if I can interject uh, once again, this is Aninda Bhattacharya. Um, so what kind of mobilities are you looking at here or diffusion coefficients of lithium uh, in this compound? If, uh, I mean, you may, you, you, may you can answer later as well. It doesn't matter. You, 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 answer, you may right. interject and I will answer in the next slide. Oh, oh all right. So, okay. So, <laughs> um, so if you think about, for those of you who haven't really thought about lithium mobility in these compounds, what you're seeing is lithium hopping in the lithium layers of these materials. So lithium is in an octahedral site, it needs to then hop via a tetrahedral site into the next lithium site nearby. In that tetrahedral site, that's almost the sort of act, the transition state, because you've got a very uh, close contact between the transition metal in the layer below. And so that distance is going to be important. It's also going to be important that you have vacancies nearby and that and, and it's easier when you actually have two vacancies nearby because it minimizes the repulsion. But so that then says that when you start to introduce vacancies in the structure, the, the lithium mobility goes up. And so the lithium mobility will depend on the number of vacancies, but it will also depend on what the activation barrier is. And that's going to be dictated by the nature of this transition metal ion. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but first of all, what Katerina did was to develop a, a model to simulate the spectra. So she took that um, this model I showed you here, but all of these different configurations, and then she input the frequencies of the hops of the lithium ions in the lattice, and then asked how would those spectra um, collapse as the lithium ions start to move. And so what happens when the lithium ions are moving is you get what is classic sort of two site exchange problem in NMR where things broaden and then they eventually coalesce into the average of this configuration. And so she was able to derive a model where um, you had actually two components. There were the mobile components and the, 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 what she calls the not mobile, so the rigid components that fit the spectrum very nicely. And as you increasingly pulled more lithium from the structure, you ended up fitting it with a single component. And from the um, from the, the line broadening and the residual line broadening, you can extract a hopping constant. And so just to sort of extract those numbers out, this is the um, hopping rate in, in kilohertz. To go back to your earlier question, these are sort of numbers that we have in this, in this time scale are going up to sort of 80 to 100 kilohertz as you start pulling lithium out of the, um, the structure. And the variation that we have is, is coming from the assumptions in the model associated with the inherent line, uh, line widths of these peaks. So there's, a, there's some error in it, but nonetheless, it's qu quite compelling that you get this dramatic increase in, in lithium um, mobility or hopping rates as you pull lithium out of the structure. And we can um, measure that as a function of temperature to get an activation barrier. And this is sort of 350 millivolts, which is a number that's of a good lithium ion conductor. It's not a brilliant one, but it's sort of a moderately good one. So that all makes sense with the sort of the rate performance of this. And so let's sort of go back to unpicking why you've got this dependence on, um, on lithium state and conductivity. So the, the first one is sort of fairly obvious. I talked about the onset of you need vacancies for the lithium ions to move. The second one is, is, is less obvious, but it's pretty obvious when you actually think about the structures of these materials. So what you're looking at here is an in situ diffraction pattern collected by Kent Griffith at, at Argonne National Lab as a function of state of charge. So um, this is the 003 peak. So this is the, the direct measure of the spacings between the transition metal ions. So it's this distance from here to here. So you're plotting it, so it's, it's originally starting to increase, so you're shifting to lower D spacings, and then it goes back again as the layers start to collapse. And this is what's shown here, so you have an expansion of the layers and then a rapid collapse. And the expansion reaches a maximum at 0.65, and so you would think that would be where the sort of, the, the, the lithiums would, when you start to collapse, it would start to be poorer lithium mobility at that point. But actually, if you decompose the the differences in the expansions of the lithium layers and the transitional metal layers, you sort of see that the collapse of the lithium spacings happens at 0.75, and that's where we see the lithium mobility decreasing. So um, just to sort of, um, somebody probably needs to mute out there, um, that it, the other thing that's important is as you go up in charge, the, the layers collapsing again is, is reducing the distance between the, the the lithiums in the tetrahedral site and the layer below, which is the transition state of this. And this was sort of shown earlier by work of Gerd Sado and Kisa Kang and, and John Reed and Anton van der Ven. 
in his group at the time. Um, but so the distance is important and also the oxidation state. And so the higher the oxidation state, the, the bigger the repulsion between the lithium plus and the, the metal four plus if it's fully oxidized. And so that explains why in general at the top of charge, you've got both a collapse of the layers and you've got highly charged layer, lithiums in the layer above and so mobility goes down. And so this is also consistent with GITT measurements, which is an electrochemical measurement of measuring the lithium transport. And so the sort of implications at a very simple level is if you want to cycle fast, you should cycle between the regimes of 0.25 and 0.75 to get lower resistances. Okay, can I ask a question? Yes, uh, you sorry. may now ask a question. <laughs> sorry, interrupting so, so much. So can you go back the slide, the trend in the curve that you got for the hopping rate? Yeah. Uh, why does it drop off from 0.6 to 0.8? Like as you remove more and more lithium, um, I would have, uh, what, is there a barrier for the lithium transport now? Well, this is what I'm trying to sort of say is that you've got two things. You've got the collapse of the layer that's sort of starting at this point, but then you've also got increased the activation barriers going up because you're now hopping in a lattice where most of the transition metal is higher charge and so the transition the activation barrier goes up okay so, so it's, it's two phenomena and um you know at, by the time you've really clamped the layers back together and then you've got four plus ions at the top of charge you're sort of slowing everything down the other thing that i haven't talked about as well because i haven't quantified it so directly is you're also you've got because you've got fewer um nickel four plus the electronic hopping is going down and in these systems, there's a very strong correlation between the lithium plus and the electron. So they will, you know, these are small polarons, so to degree that they will hop together. And oh. so you'll be in a much more localized thing where now a lithium probably sits, you know, next to the very few remaining nickel three pluses. But also at this point, you're just starting to oxidize the cobalt three plus to four plus. And so you've got a lot of factors that pin the lithium both the structural the activation barrier and also the electronic one so and the other question that i have is when you get these hopping rates you're doing it uh, through a temperature dependent study isn't it well we're yeah. getting the hopping rates from that simulation at one temperature we're getting the activation barrier by studying it as a function of temperature so when you are doing a say a temperature dependence in these materials do you worry about the phase change that might happen um, under certain ranges? Yeah, we, we, we worry about that tremendously, which is why you saw, um, you know, the temperatures of which we were studying them are very limited. All um, narrow window, narrow it, window. Because if, you, if you're up to above 100 degrees centigrade, for some of the fully charged materials, you start to see transformation. So, so yes, I mean, this is one of the problems of these materials is that once you start going to high volt high voltages and high temperatures, then you will get degradation and structural transformations. In practice, they don't really happen till 150, although their surface processes happen much earlier on. Um, the other reason, just for the NMR people in the audience, is that we're doing these very fast spinning experiments, and it's quite difficult to get probes that spin that fast um, to go higher than these temperatures. But you can with other probes, and we could have done this, but this is you know this is just limited. Oh, thanks. That's clear. Yeah. Well, can I just okay. follow up on that question? Of course. Uh, uh, I, I would say like temperature range is so narrow, but I would say the effects are very dramatic. The changes yeah. in uh, the hopping rates, they, they're insanely high. I mean, is, is it expected or is it uh, something that- yeah, No, it's, it's consistent with, um, you know, it's consistent with an activation barrier of, of 350 millivolts. Um, and it's just that um, the thing about NMR is, maybe we're just lucky is that when you're in the right range of lith when the lithium mobility is in in a particular range that we call the intermediate regime it's highly sensitive to very small changes in, in frequency you could be in regimes where you're static where you'd see very little with this particular you're in that right regime you can be in a very small very small changes in the hopping frequency will have dramatic effects so uh, and essentially an order of magnitude, you'll go through this so-called intermediate regime between a static spectrum where you see no effect to a, a fast regime where you basically don't see an effect either because you're too fast. And that will happen in almost an order of magnitude of the hopping rates. And so if you're in luck, you hit the right temperature and you hit the right and you see it. If you're not in luck, 
you don't see it. And I'll just show you in the next slide how we could get at another time scale. So, and I'm going to show you as the talk progresses different methods that you can get at different time scales of mobility. But this is the easiest one that you get if you're lucky that the motion is in that time scale. And it's the time scale that's dictated by, and this goes back to the, the earlier question, it's the time scale that's dictated by the differences in these different, it's called hyperfine, it's called chemical shift here, but that's really incorrect. It's the hyperfine shift. It's just the, but anyways, the separation in frequencies, and that's the time scale. So if your separation in frequencies in the kilohertz, then you're looking at motion in that kilohertz time scale. Thanks. Okay, um, right. I just want to sort of put a battery thing and put it into context to sort of explain why this is important. If you look at these materials, NMC 811s that I've been talking about, or the NCA, which is the one with the aluminium in it, what's interesting is when you charge and you discharge, you can't get all of the lithium back in again. And so you end up with a what's known as irreversible first capacity loss of about 12 percentage. And it doesn't depend on how what cutoff voltage you go to. You get the same amount. But if you go up in temperature, it decreases. So, you know, it doesn't take much um, brain power at this point to think, well, actually, that sounds like it's the same thing that we're talking about. And it's kinetic in origin. And furthermore, if you hold at low voltages, you can actually force the lithium back in again. And so that's exactly what we did. And we, as um, Antonon Grenier, who is a postdoc in Karina Chapman's lab in, in Stony Brook with Pete Chupas in collaboration with Phil Reeves, my former student, took the NCA material. So this is something with 5% aluminium in it. He charged it up, put the lithiums back in again, but could only get 90% back in again. And until unless he held at 24 hours, he could force back all in the lithium. And so to prove that this was the same thing, um, first of all, he did the, no, this is now Phil did the NMR, where um, he took the normal one and saw that there was a decrease in signal. So these are all, so this is the other thing about NMR that I should be careful about. If you do it properly, it's quantitative. So you can weigh the sample and you can then work out how many spins you have in your sample. And so he saw a decrease to only 89% of the original lithium spins relative to the pristine material. So the original one, but when he held it at low voltages, um, he could get pretty much all the lithium back in again. You can also use other NMR nuclei. And so again, um, aluminium is one that a lot of NMR spectroscopists know and love. Um, and you can look at things like the coatings on these materials um, so, and metallic impurities that even come from scraping the, the material off the aluminium current collector. You can see that. And then you can also see the bulk aluminium, and now that's shifted to negative frequencies because it's in the same layer as the um, the transition metals and so it, the nickel actually results in a negative shift and this is also looked at by Nicole Leifer and Folia Dogan in their work and what's interesting is when you track that you can see a distinct signal that's different when if you haven't got all the lithiums back in again so this is the partially uh, discharged and this is the, the original material so the aluminium is very consistent so um, Phil did exactly the same thing that Katarina did he measured the lithium mobility and got the hopping rates by exactly the same approaches doing the variable temperature NMR. And again, when um, 0.86 of the lithiums, um, were, were, we still had 0.86 in the sample, so I've changed the, the meaning of X. Now X is fully, fully lithiated, 0.86 is 14% removed. You can see there's a little bit of change of temperature. And this is now just simply coming from the fact these are paramagnetic materials. So you change the temperature, the susceptibility changes, and so you get less of a shift. There's a little bit of line broadening suggesting that lithium is starting to happen, but at 0.71, it's really very mobile, which is the same as we saw before. And so to get at the, um, I think it was your question, Fanny, about what do you do when you looking at slower motion, the second method we use is the so-called T2 measurements and what you do to measure a T2. So this is the spin-spin relaxation in the transverse plane. So we, we do a pulse, we flip it into the XY direction, the lithium ions move around and then we give them a pi pulse. And then if, if they haven't moved, we should be able to refocus the signal. And the, 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 the natural decay is the T2. But if we get additional decay because the lithiums have hopped and they've changed the frequency, then they're no longer refocused. And so you can measure that via the T2 or the, technically the T2 star of this. And what you see is a dramatic, so in red goes over to the T2. You see this dramatic decrease in the T2 
at about um, 0.86. Uh, so we're moving 14%. So that would be a way of getting a slower motional processes that are now in this time scale dictated by the separation of the pulses. And so this is now in the sort of microsecond time scale. So 10 to the minus four again, so because it's 100 microseconds. So just to sort of pull it all together, this then shows you that the problem you have is when you discharge your materials, it's so um, poorly lithiated, you, you have to really hold it a long time in order to get the lithium back into your structure. And so that, that's another implication of this very low lithium, lithium mobility at the bottom of charge. Now, this is something I want to come back to in my next talk um, tomorrow, if, if you're still there to sort of carry on with the implications of this. Okay, Can so I quickly interject. You uh, may. Is, is this true just for the first cycle, or is it true if you uh, go on to do the subsequent cycles as well? Because so it, the, yeah. there is a difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you hold it and you get all the lithium back in again, it does exactly the same thing in the second cycle. If you just carry on blindly, you don't hold, then you end up cycling your battery between 0 0.9 and um, and and um, so 0 0.9 lithium and the top of charge. Now. To a certain extent, it doesn't matter because when you build a full cell, you lose about four to five percent, depending on how you build a full cell into the graphite because of the formation of the SEI. But still, if you're building a, a good cell and you've got good additives, you're, you're probably losing five percent more than you really want. So it is actually something that you know you do need to think about if you could somehow design your material to to um to that not to happen and it's interesting that lithium carbon oxide doesn't do this which is something i want to talk about in my next talk so where i'm going to be going i'm going to be here you know very very late in the evening but that that's fine by me um okay so uh, <laughs> what i want to now move on is to talk about sort of our in situ experiments and um what we're doing and, and the challenges that are, that are and i just wanted to sort of for those not in the battery field, just to remind people that there are just sort of many, many processes that need to be understand, understood. Some of them are practical and some of them are key fundamental questions. And they go all the way through from structure all the way to sort of questions at the, the pack level and particle level. And ideally we should do this, we should look at these processes in situ, although recognizing you know, processes that happen over many, many years, you know, how do you understand those in the time scale of most experiments, which are, are days or months, not years. Anyway, so let's all um, agree that we should do some magnetic resonance studies and we should try and do them in situ. Let's think about the challenges that we might address. The first one is that NMR is a method where you use a radio frequency field and you go in and it excites the spins and radio frequency fields cannot get inside metal because you've got skin depth problems that I'll talk about, but basically it's the same problem if you're sitting in a basement and you want to pick up the radio, you don't get a signal, it's, it's, a, it's a good Faraday cage. So that's not going to work, the standard batteries are not going to work. There are also safety issues that we need to worry about, and this is a lithium silicon battery that was possibly charged too fast and may have interacted with the RF. So, But leaving that aside, let's think about the NMR. The other problem we have is that we've got lots of different materials that have very different interactions. So you've got potentially ferromagnetic materials that are not very good inside NMR coils. You've got metals that have these large shifts called night shifts. So moderately small for lithium, much bigger for sodium. And then you've got these hyperfine shifts that could shift over many, many frequencies. And then at the same time, you've got the diamagnetic components, the electrolyte and the SEI, passivating layer sitting at zero ppm with very different characteristics. And so some of these may change when you're cycling. And so we need to worry about that. And then we need to worry about the practical issues of doing NMR where we're connecting up a battery cycler. And so when the cycler is being connected, it brings in a whole load of noise into the circuitry. So we're gonna to have to filter this out. And so this is the so-called wobble curve that for Brooker used for tuning. And if it's very noisy, you just see that being picked up. So what um, my, my first student on the project, Barish Key, did was to, um, to really get this going for these plastic bag battery designs um, coming out of Belcourt, helped with Jean-Marie Tarascon and his group at the time. And here you can see nicely how you solve the RF problem because you basically put your battery in a plastic bag. It's the same bag that you would use to seal food in or coffee, which is why they're also known as coffee bag batteries. We use these meshes that, and then so you can see a mesh coming in in both directions. If it's a standard battery, it'll be copper on one side for the anode, aluminium on the other side for the, the cathode. This is obviously a copper copper one here. You can see the separator 
which is a, a we use either cell guard, the commercial one, or, or borosilicate if we want more electrolyte, which separates the two components, and we seal them all up and we just we, we, we laminate them and put them in the cell. Uh, if we want something that's a little bit more airtight and has better compression between the cells, we use these so-called capsule cells where we just basically put everything in, in plastic and we seal them with a sleeve. And those are pretty airtight. So they're sort of quite good for sodium studies. And then we've over the years with um, NMR services have tried to, um, NMR, the group with Marco Brown have, have developed these probes now uh, where we can both um, connect up the battery cycler to the bottom. So the, the, the leads come in and you can cycle your battery here. So there are the connections for the battery and there's the coil. And then we have piezoelectric motors inside, which allows us to automatically tune the probe. And you can do things like respond to when something becomes metallic, or even we can put the same um, robots that do the tuning on our normal probes and we can jump between nuclei. So this is an example, not for the batteries, but just a normal magic angle spinning probe where we can hop from lithium to phosphorus in a, a lithium ion phosphate sample, where that requires a tuning of five megahertz. And so these things are standard in solution NMR probes, but are not, are not standard in solids probes. So this is a very useful thing to be able to do this automatically tuning. Um, so just to sort of give you some illustrations of what, what we can do with it, this is the sort of early work of Barish where he looked at lithium silicides and lithium silicides are very interesting as replacements to graphite because you can get 10 times more lithium into them. So about four lithiums react with one silicon, while it's only six carbons react with one lithium. And so that gives you an overall energy density gravimetrically and volumetrically of 10. The problem with lithium silicides is they don't when they're fully reacted, they're very close to lithium metal in their potential. So they're close to zero volts. And that means that the electrolyte that's near them is, is not stable and it gets reduced. And in a graphite battery, that's stopped by having this passivating layer to call the SEI. Uh, but silicon, because it expands and contracts because you add so much lithium to it, doesn't form this very good passivating layer. And so this back now um, almost uh, 12 years ago, was one of the first studies to really point out that there was a problem of creating this stable SEI. And so when you just I'll just show the movie again, um, when you look at the material and you just rest it, you see the OC fee go up, but you also see the signal of this, what we called an over lithiated phase. So lithium with a little bit more, a silicon with a little bit more lithium in it, and it gets oxidized itself as the electrolyte is being reduced. And so this is just showing the contour plot, looking at um, the, the lithium spectrum as a function of um, lithiation. And, and uh, the, the, the main point of the study was that when we'd looked at this exit, you we'd never actually seen this extra phase because it was so unstable uh, and it didn't survive assembly. So we've now moved on to use our in situ NMR for lots of different applications. And I want to just um, give you- Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, just to interject again, this is Aninda. Um, Hi, Aninda. Yeah, uh, so you know, you know, in all these alloying systems, uh, uh, you know, people say in you know in silicon you have four point four uh, insertion of lithium, but people have also uh, said that you know you form other phases. You, know, you mm -hmm. don't really insert four point four. You know, you have less than that. Is it possible that you in your studies? You saw there is a strong kinetic effect, and it never reaches. Uh, that. Yeah, so it, it, in our, it, I mean, Bob Huggins, who mapped the phase diagram out many, many years ago, saw lithium 4.4 or 4.2, um, but that's at 400 degrees centigrade at room temperature. You know, you form these, I mean, this is another whole talk, um, but you form these amorphous structures. So what you're seeing here is lithiating the silicon and you're forming compounds that are so you start with the crystalline lattice, you break the crystalline lattice up and you form these amorphous structures. And then out of this amorphous structure crystallizes this crystalline phase, Li15, Si4. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't actually crystallize the Si, the 4.2 phase. Um, and you can only crystallize that after multiple cycles and at a higher temperatures. And it's actually quite interesting because, because you need to crystallize this I know this is sort of an oxymoron, but you need to crystallize a crystalline phase out of an amorphous phase, breaking of what you, what, because it's very difficult to break silicon-silicon bonds, 
Mm -hmm. um, if you looked at the phase diagram, there are a whole bunch of different lithiated phases that form, but you can't start with the crystalline lattice and form them. And so you end up having to basically rip the whole structure apart so that at about silicon um, 3.7, 3.5, so lithium 3.5 silicon, that's the point where you only have isolated silicon anions in the lattice, and only then can you crystallize out this phase that has isolated silicons. Mm -hmm. So you can pick up signatures here, and those are signatures of silicon dumbbells, or silicon-silicon bonds that have remained that are residual in the lattice. So you can start to pull out, if you start with a, a diamond lattice and you start breaking bonds, you see motifs of uh, three, uh, four silicons together. You can see two of them together. And we could see that with our pair distribution function analysis work. And then the one that's very clear is this signature of these silicon dumbbells. And as you cycle the silicon more, you know, once you've formed, when you charge it up, you then form an amorphous structure and you can continue to cycle and you can see these very strong characteristic signals of both the dumbbell structures and then the isolated silicon. So just a, another naive, very naive question, um, uh, especially in that remark, electrolytes are unstable at low voltages. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been a lot of, uh, you know, reports, more kind of engineering these uh, silicon or tin uh, mm -hmm where they say, you know, they have some additives and, you know, the, the electrolytes, uh, you know, kind of polymerize around the mm -hmm. silicon particles or tin particles. That leads to, uh, uh, so will this lead to substantial changes in the signature of, uh, in NMR? Uh, because they kind of stabilize the silicon, they, you know, stop it from further being reactive or pulverized. Yeah, I mean, we, we look at um, the signal of the, the bulk, the lithium psilocytes, and we can continue to see them. I mean, what happens with all of, I mean, there's a whole work of to sort of sum it up of people who put graphene sheets over and, and the graphene is a much more stable structure to form an SEI on. You can put other polymers around it and a degree they help um, produce a more stable SEI on the surface and that that mitigates these side reactions and you can you can see the effects of that on NMR via the sort of the diamagnet some of this peak here is due to the SEI but mm -hmm. at the same time you can still then see the lithium psilocyte doing its thing it's just that even with these all these extra additives and coatings there is still this slow degradation of the electrolyte that's going on and it's sort of you know from a practical perspective it depends on how long you want the silicon to last for because i mean no one has really managed to do a 99.999 percent recurring sort of passivating layer because this silicon balloons up as you expand and contract it exactly. thank you yeah. but i mean i can yeah you know, i can give you another talk on that to add some slides on that tomorrow <laughs> if it's interest from from other people as well okay i want to just um now there's, there's just one more question. I'm sorry. There's, okay. uh, yeah. So that's Abhinav Chaudhary from YouTube is asking how the interferences between the alternating current of the NMR and the direct current of the electrochemical circuits are handled when the electrochemical cell is implemented inside the NMR coil. Um, I mean, to sort of paraphrase that question, I mean, the, the sort of other question is, do we see any interference of the... With, we're using RF, and does that affect the battery performance in any way? So the answer is we've rarely seen problems. I showed you a picture of that battery that blew up, so it's possible that may have been something. There are semiconducting systems where, um, so slight, not great conductors, where there's been some evidence that applying RF heats causes heating effects. And so, you know, the general thought is that um, metals, you, if you heat, if you heat a metal up and you get the right frequency, you can get um, heating effects there. It doesn't seem to be in our hands so bad with the, the metals, it seems to be worse in semiconductors. So it's kind of something we have to watch out for. It hasn't been so pr prohibitive without you know, there have been a few exceptions and some antimonies where we've obviously seen heating effects, but largely we haven't. We are playing with um, AC effects, and I'll, I, maybe I can answer the, the next part of that question in my supercat work, because that's where um, you know some of these 
you know, one of the interesting things from a sort of comparison of batteries is that we 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 use impedance measurements all the time. And in an impedance measurement, you you look at the response of your battery or your material as a function of alternating AC. And by changing the frequency of the AC, you know, you unpick different processes with the final one being the, the conduction of the, the ions. And so what I really want to do in NMR is to sort of use some of these AC approaches to, to try and understand the, the mobility and the processes in the NMR. And I'll, 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 I'll mention a little bit of how far we're going with that in this one. I've just explained the next part of my super cap. So I, super cap part. So I think it's important and I'll, I'll talk about interactions with metal a little bit more later on as well, which I think will also help answer that question. So let me just, let me just quickly um, explain this side because I just want to show you um, for people who are not um, interested in batteries, but interested in carbons, one, one I think is a very nice application of our in-situ NMR and super caps. So super caps are sort of bridging between dielectric capacitors and batteries in that they have sort of intermediate um, powers, but um, reasonable energy densities. And so this is what's known as a Rigoni plot with a specific energy on one side and, and power on, on the other side. And so there's the, there's the super cap and there are your sort of lithium ion batteries. And they're made, um, they're made from coconuts. And so um, there are various sources of coconuts. I mean, there's apparently very good ones in Sri Lanka. Don't ask me why these coconuts are better than other coconuts, but anyway, um, you heat them up and you activate them at different temperatures using um, hydroxides and, or steam. And you get these sort of beautiful hierarchical materials where the, you can imagine that some of the, the structures are coming from the underlying lig lignans of, of your coconut shells. This is a, um, a PTFE fiber that's used to hold the structure together. And they basically have surface areas of almost up to 2000 meters squared per gram. So they're really um, micron sized particles with, with um, sort of zeolitic type surface areas. And so they're, they're used in many applications. They're in mobile phones, in the flashes, they're in um, the emergency exits of Airbus um, planes. And um, what they, they work with nominally by storing charge in the form of a double layer. So you have a porous structure. And when you charge the, if you charge it positively, then the negative ions go in and they, they, they compensate that way. So that was kind of the thinking of how these things work before we started. And some of the first work that um, Hao Wang did was to actually show that um, even at zero volts, you had both negative ions and positive ions in them. And this is not really too surprising because the same materials that are used for a super caps are the same materials that you use for water filtration. And so, you know, there we, we rely on the fact that ions go in. So the fact that they do in these systems is, is, is not that obvious. It's, sorry, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, the, the electrolytes are, are organic in, in the higher um, energy density system. So you have acetonitrile and then you have cations. They could be BF4 minus as the anion and tetraethyl ammonium ions or as, as the cations. And so what we showed over the years, or we developed a method to test how charge compensation might occur. And so if you start with a zero volt system where you've got equal numbers of negative ions and positive ions, you could imagine a scenario where when you charge positively, you kick the positive ions out. When you charge negatively, uh, sorry, you, or you could, so you could kick the ions out, or you could imagine the negative ions going in, or you could just swap them out. So you had an imbalance of positive and negative. So that was the ion expansion, ion expulsion mechanism. This was the ion absorption mechanism, and this is the ion exchange mechanism. So we sort of proposed these as the extreme ways of thinking about charge storing. And then we looked at um, the in situ NMR of these things. And I'm just gonna show you one example. This is the fluorine NMR of the BF4 minus ion. And you're seeing on the right, this little movie of it, being charged up positively. And what we've done is we've taken our electrode and we've split the electrode out. So we're just looking at one electrode in the NMR coil. So we can separate what's going on in the positive and what's going on in the negative. And when you're at zero volts, you'll see this peak here at negative PPM. And this is the ions that are inside these pores. And so these carbons are very graphitic. You have these large graphene sheets but they're propped apart about 1.2 to 1.8 nanometers apart because of the defects in the lattices. <clears throat> and so what you're seeing in this negative shift is simply a ring current. And so those of us who grew up with NMR are used to the NMR of benzene and the, the sort of additional explanation is this proton is seeing the, the ring current from the benzene rings. 
And that's because the proton is on the edge of the, the, the ring. But if you're on top of the ring, you actually see a negative shift. So you see one that's the opposite in sign. And we can calculate that via so-called nuclear independent chemical shift calculations, where we come down with ions on top of increasingly large fragments of um, benzene. So this is a coronine. We did dice, we did bigger increasingly coronines, and we saw the same effect where if you come in closer to the face, closer to the surface, you get a larger shift. And so this is not a chemical shift. It doesn't really matter what nucleus you look at it. You could look at it with the boron, the fluorine, the and the, the, the cation, you get exactly the same shift. And so then what we did was to quantify the intensity of this signal as you charge positively and as you charge negatively. And by looking at the, the fluorine and the, the anion, and then we did an experiment where we used a, a phosphorus cation, so a PET4. Um, so we could look at the phosphorus signal. We were able to quantify the number of ions that went into the pores when we charge positively and when we charge negatively. And we found that on, on, on negative charging, we got a cation absorption phenomenon. So the anions stayed the same, the cations went in. And when we went positively, we got an ion exchange where the ions went in, the anions went in, and then we kicked the, the, the cations out. And then in a, in a sort of other experiment I'm not showing here, we then measured the diffusion coefficients of this. And we showed that when you have more ions in the, the system, much more clogged and the diffusion coefficients went down. So it was just a very simple way of um, showing you how we can look at the mechanisms of supercaps. We can quantify how it happens. We can also say something about the electronic structures of, of the, the carbons as we insert ions into them. Uh, Claire, I have a question here. Yep. Um, it's a very interesting study, uh, this one. Uh, so I, I'm actually talking about a hypothetical uh, scenario where, let's say the pore size is such that, uh, you know, the cation or the anion is unable to reside inside the pore. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a play of one type of ion going in and out. Because mm -hmm. uh, there were some studies talking about critical pore sizes, which will uh, determine the uh, supercapacitive action. Yeah. So um, how different, I mean, uh, will be the NMR then? Because here you are able to clearly say it's the cation going in or the anion, both going in or one staying inside. But I'm saying, I'm talking about a scenario where one really does not go in. It's just yeah. the way of one of the Ions. That's right. But what we have, we have two ways of looking at that. And we can, because we can quantify the ions that go in, we can then say in a scenario, I mean, if you had a material that um, you know, did that, and we had selective, I mean, we, we looked at other ions with bigger ions and smaller cations. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so because we can quantify the number of ions that are in the pores, we can answer that question. We can show that only one ion is going in and the other isn't. And um, for example, we've shown that if you cycle more rapidly, that will then change the rate of which some ions go in and some ions don't go in. And um, the other thing that we have is, and this I haven't talked about, um, you can see here that depending on how close you are to the pores, pore walls, the bigger the shift. Right, right. And, and so what we've done is we've looked at different carbons with different spacings Mm -hmm. And we've used the, the shift you've seen here. So this shift here is about 7 ppm. And we've related the size of the shift to um, the size of the coronine fragments and the spacing. So we've been able to take the spacings between the, the carbons coming out of a BET measurement. So you can, right, right. You, can, you can extract the sizes of the pores from the BET. And then by using that and the NMR, we're then able to say something about the size and the coherence lengths of the carbons. And so we can unpick a little bit about which pores the ions are going into within the caveat that again, going back to the sort of questions about mobility, these ions are moving very fast. And so the ions are sampling lots of different pores, but we're, so we're, what we're seeing is the time average of the ions that are seeing the different pores. Right. But we can look right. at the differences in the right. time right. average and say something about that. So. And, and just, just to go back to that question on from the YouTube about AC, what we're trying to do now is because you know supercaps are high rate materials, and so you should be able to get the ions in very quickly. And so what we're trying to do is to do AC measurements of alternating the voltage to try and see if we can 
you know, sort of clever way, capture the ions that go in at high rates as opposed to the ones that go in at, at lower rates and try and pull out the time scales of the different processes of these things. It turns out it's more challenging because you have to build good super caps in your in situ cell that can do these high rates. And you know, the, the sort of plastic bag designs are not that great, but we've 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 come across, we've we've figured out ways to sort of handle this. And we've also done um, magnetic resonance imaging experiments that I'll talk a little bit more about that allow us to do that. So, <clears throat> so just to sort of move on to um and some more applications. I just really wanted to touch on sodium um, because it's sort of the next generation uh, battery technology. And if you're thinking about a grid scale battery, um, you know, maybe you need to, be, to move away from lithium to sodium uh, just because of its natural abundance being that much larger. It, and it's also what's nice about it is you can use a, a aluminium current collector on, the, on the, the anode side because sodium doesn't react with aluminium unlike the lithium. So that's another sort of cost savings. It's also what's known as sort of a drop-in technology in that it looks very much like a lithium ion battery. So you don't need to reinvent the whole ways that you process and you make batteries. But one of its challenges is that you can't get a sodium inside a graphite. So in your anode side, you can't use a graphite. So lithium goes into graphite, potassium goes into graphite, but sodium doesn't, it's just the wrong size. And so you've got to come up with a new uh, anode material and the sort of best contender is a hard carbon. So hard carbon is, is the same as the super cap carbon I just showed you, except that it's not activated to make all of these extra holes. It's still got some holes in the lattice. It's, it's sort of a graphitic structure, but uh, it's got defects that hold the layers apart a little bit more and they're more sort of wavy and, and um, not, not graphitic like, and that's sort of the distinction of what a hard carbon is that it decomposes before it graphitizes. Anyway, so we can now do sodium NMR. So sodium is 100% abundant nucleus. It's a quadrupolar nucleus, but it's very similar in many ways to lithium, except it's got more issues of quadrupolar that we sometimes have to deal with. And so this is just an illustration of a sodium NMR of the hard carbon versus a sodium metal anode. So this is the shift of about um, 1100 um, uh, PPM from the sodium metal uh, in, in a cell where we built it against sodium metal. And this is now the signal of the sodium going into the hard carbon along this sloping process and then the flat process near zero volts. And this sloping process, you actually only see a very short, small shift to negative PPM and that's coming from these ring current effects I talked to you about. But when you then push into this flat region, you see this shift in this direction. This is the night, this is not a hyperfine shift. This is now called, coming from something called the night shift, which is a signature of it being a metal. And this shift is a direct measure of the density of states at the lithium, sorry, at the sodium S orbital. Um, and so you can relate that to the degree of metallicity as probed by the sodium. And this is a clear signature of the fact that these hard carbons contain little holes in them where you can form little sodium pools, as they're called. And the sort of the bigger the, 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 the pools, the holes, and also the bigger the interaction with the carbons, you, that modulates these shifts. But basically, you can use this in situ NMR to track the sodiation process in hard carbons. And so that, that's a sort of nice way of looking at these materials. You can also look at um, different um, anode materials and one contender is, 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 so, is tin. So you can form a whole series of sodium tin phases. And what we wanted to do was to try and solve the structures. And this is a sort of story in itself, but you can see from the, the voltage profile of tin versus sodium that you've got lots of different phases and they, you know, each of these different phases and structural transformations has characteristic signatures. And we can study that by um, a combination of sodium NMR and also tin NMR. And we can contrast this with a technique called pair distribution function analysis uh, that my group has done a lot of over the years. And this is a technique where you take a diffraction pattern or technically the total scattering, you Fourier transform from reciprocal space, which is your diffraction method into real space. And you get these pairwise correlations. And each of these peaks corresponds to a different tin tin or sodium tin uh, distance in the solid and its intensity gives you the amount of these different correlations and so you start off with seeing wiggles or peaks that come from the tin in the structure and they go out for long distance because it's crystalline 
And then when you get to this region of the phase diagram or the sodiation state, you can see that the wiggles are disappearing and that's because you form an amorphous phase, but even an amorphous phase has local structure, which you can learn something about it. And so we did a lot of it in a very careful studying, combining with DFT studies of our colleague, Andrew Morris, to try and solve the structures of these different tin phases by using you know, both the DFT for structure solution, the NMR for local structure and PDF to complement the local structure. Claire. This yes. is beautiful stuff. Uh, can you just yeah keep that? Hold on to that slide. So um, uh, this is um, you're actually cycling the sodium back to the carbon and coming out. So my question to you is, I can see the spread in the in the contour. So it's it's like um, maybe it's uh, downfield shifting as you're going in the cycle, going to ten hours, and then. It's again coming back. Yes, it's coming back. Yeah. And then when you go for the second cycle, the spread of that is slightly smaller and the intensities are slightly different. Do you think that the material has changed over 75 or like 40 hours of uh, like monitoring it for in the, NM, in the NMR coil? So these are very, very good points. The first spread that you get is reflective of the fact that these are disordered materials. And so you will have a distribution in the sort of pore sizes and the nature of the interactions with the carbon walls, because, you know, remember, we're always measuring the sodium. So even in a metallic compound where you're bound, where you've got a binding to the carbon, there will be a degree of sharing those electrons. And so that's, that's sort of the electronic information we get. But in answer to your question of why is this looking slightly worse, um, that's most likely because um, sodium, uh, these, these are highly reactive compounds. Again, you're very close to the sodium, you know, you're close to this, you're missing the, I'm sorry about this, but you're missing the, the voltage here. You've got the names of the people as opposed to the that's okay. that's <laughs> voltage, but this is, this line here is zero volts. And so you're so close to plating sodium metal and you're again decomposing the electrolyte and you're forming um, a passivating layer and the resistance to get, um, because you've got this passivating layer, the cell is becoming more resistive. And as you're holding here, what you see is you were holding it just above zero volts to slowly get the, the sodium in through this passivating layer. And we haven't held long enough in order uh -huh. for that to happen. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a real phenomenon and it's coming from the fact that we haven't optimized this cell to, to, to minimize the degradation and the SEI formation. And so as a result, it's becoming more resistive and it's more difficult to get the sodium in. So that's what you're seeing there. Yeah, this beautiful data here. Thanks. Thank you. So that's, that's beautiful data collected by Josh Stratford and, and Phoebe. So we did also the tin work as well. So I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about the lithium dendrites because I wanted to sort of talk leads on to some new stuff we're doing. And we've been very interested, and this is work of Rangit Bhattacharya, who is from Bangalore. So he worked for um, Anil Kumar many years ago before, well, not many years ago, but before joining my group when I was back in Stony Brook. And he did some really smart, and he's now, he's now back in India running his own group. Um, he did some really smart work where he recognized the fact that uh, when you have a dendrite, these dendrites are sort of micron thick, um, that, that you would be able to detect them quantitatively because the skin depth, which is the depth at which an RF can get into the metal, depends on the resistivity or the conductivity of your metal and also the frequency. And so at 77 megahertz, which is our 4.7 Tesla field, we can penetrate about 15 microns. So that means you can see a dendrite, but you may not see the full lithium metal. So you only see the first 15 microns of that. And why are these dendrites at bad news is that if you cycle, first of all, you form these mossy structures and at some point you go dendritic and then you can have short circuits which have been implicated in, in battery fires, in, including the, the Dreamliner battery. So we've done a lot of work over the years on this that I'll just briefly summarize up, but this is just sort of illustrate what you can do. So this is a so-called symmetric cell where you go backwards and forwards. And as the current increases, you can see that um, the signal starts to increase of the lithium metal and this additional peak grows up and that's you seeing the dendrite. And what you're seeing is an increase in the active surface area, the RF can penetrate more. And so you can quantify the amount of dendrites and the conditions under which you form them. And what's also interesting is if you look at the zero PPM range, this is the SEI. 
So this is the formation of a passivating layer that grows on top. And because again, the lithium metal is the most reactive, it grows and as it grows, it gets covered with this. And so you can see that at the same time. And for those of you who are quick and might want to say, well, is this a new form of lithium? No, it's not a new form of lithium. Um, it's actually just due to the um, fact that as you grow out of a metal structure, you see different local fields coming from the fact that lithium metal is a temperature independent paramagnet. And so depending on whether you're more mossy or you're more dendritic, you actually get different shifts. So you can even use this to say something about microstructure. And this is some very nice work done by Andy Eilert with He Jung Chang and Nicole. And so then, and this was something that um, Madhu mentioned earlier on, as we worked with Alexei Jershaw to really think about how we could use magnetic resonance imaging methods to look at this phenomena. And so this is an illustration of the first imaging experiments we did. Um, so what you've got is, a, is a, a little tube with two bits of lithium metal here, and this is the electrolyte, and we flowed the lithium in one direction. And when you do that, they then plate and in the opposite direction, the PF6 minus ions, the counter ions flow in that direction. And if we just focus on the red, this is the, um, so this is a chemical shift image. So we can look at either the lithium metal or we can look at the electrolyte. So what happens is when you flow lithium is in one direction for charge neutrality, the lithiums deposit, the PF6 don't. And so they build up with this, um, electrolyte concentration gradient. And even though I'm looking at the lithiums, it's really a signature of what the PF6 minuses are up to too, because the lithiums and the PF6 are almost the same because of charge neutrality. And so what's really interesting is initially you sort of form this more mossy structure. So you can see this nicely in the chemical shift image. So that's where you plot chemical shift versus the distant difference. And this is the sort of basis of functional MRI that you would have in sort of hospitals where you're looking at sort of brain activity, you might look at different nuclei. So here's the mossy structure, but when you get to zero concentration, so there's the concentration of the electrolyte almost drops to zero, that's when you start to go, and go dendritic. And that's because at this point you have a, a strong electric field that pulls out the dendrite or you have a space charge region that pulls it out. And that's sort of the classic uh, theory of, of dendritic growth in metal deposition that's sort of well established, but this is the first time that's seen in, in real time in the NMR battery system. And what's sort of sad about this is you could say, well, let's just reduce the current. And um, this is what we've done here where we're using a much lower current and you can see here now that the mossy structure growing nicely, but you can see even though we haven't hit zero, it, the wretched thing still grows dendritic. And why does it go? And we can model this and we can calculate this via the so-called sans time. In this case, we can predict when it happens, but even in regimes where we shouldn't get a zero electrolyte depletion, we still get this effect. And the reason we, we, we this happens is this wretched SEI, this decomposition product. And this SEI is, is actually what saves the lithium ion battery is that it forms naturally in a graphite battery. It's just enough to stop the electrolyte um, further decomposing, but when you're getting a lithium metal, it forms this very inhomogeneous um, structure with very different lithium mobility through it. And it creates this uh, inhomogeneity and electric fields and hot spots. And this is what drives the dendrite. So really in order to get lithium metal to work, you've got to get the SCI right. And so what uh, my student Anna has been doing was doing some, um, using an approach that was suggested by Alexei and, and Andy. And that's simply to plonk um, lithium six metal into a natural abundant electrolyte with lithium seven and look at the exchange between, uh, so to quantify the transport through this SEI. And what she did was to look at two different electrolytes. So this is the standard electrolyte LP30, which consists of an ethylene carbonate and dimethyl carbonate. And this is one where we've added this additive FEC or fluorinated ethylene carbonate. And that's known to polymerize to form so-called poly VC. And this is another talk I could give where we've used carbon NMR to actually show that on silicon, this, this forms as the major decomposition product. And what it does is it forms a much more elastic, integrated and, and thinner SEI. And what Anna showed very nicely was she tracked the increase in the lithium seven metal signal. So remember this is lithium six originally. So as the signal increases, that's a measure of how fast the lithium is moving through the SEI and exchanging, and then the electrolyte. And she was able to show that the LP30 um, 
exchanges were were much much slower than the L the um, so the FEC was exchange was much faster and the LP30 was much slower and this was consistent with this much thinner S um, a more homogeneous SEI with more uniform transport through the FEC system and then that, that then correlated with the ability to form much nicer dendritic structures than these horrible uh, mossy structures and the more these more filigrant filaments are covered with a lot more, more SEI and so that removes more lithium from the cell. So just to pull this whole part of my talk together, this is more recent work of Katerina where she did in situ NMR for the first time on full cells. So she's taking her 811 and she's making her graphite and she's cycling them. And just to make one point now, all of these in situ cells we're doing are all static NMR. We're not doing magic animal spinning. That's primarily because it's very difficult to spin metals and the, the cells would just become smushy messes. You would also get heating effects from the eddy currents of spinning a metal. Uh, people have done it, um, but only at slow spinning speeds. And you know, we've done it also at low spinning speeds, but um, just haven't really found it to be well, we haven't done it well enough to really get useful information out of it. So everything we do at the moment is static. And so you can see this even broader, poorer resolved spectra that actually disappears, uh, first of all. And that's because the lithiums are starting to hop. We're doing an echo experiment. So the signal's disappearing, then it comes back again. And then at the top of charge, we lose all the lithium because we've pulled all the lithium out. Uh, what you're seeing here, this line here, this is the signal of the graphite. And so you can see all of the different stages of, of the graphite signal. So this clear res resolved one is this, the combination of stage one and stage two. So it's really nice that we can now see the full commercial cells and we can start to look at things that are important. And one of them is the looking at lithium plating. And so what Katerina noticed was when she went down to zero degrees, so, uh, then the electrolyte diffusion becomes more sluggish. It becomes more difficult to get the lithium in the graphite. And this line here is not an artifact. It's the formation of lithium metal in these cells. And what was the most interesting conclusion was that once you form this lithium metal, you go up to room temperature again, and it still contain, continues to plate lithium metal. Uh, so that's once you formed it, just seems to have nucleated it. It's easier. And then we also do things like quantify um, the dissolution of the plated lithium because that can dissolve as it itself is, is oxidizing, um, is being oxidized and the electrolytes being reduced. So with that, I just um, will end this thing on the lithium plating to say that we're now also looking at solid state batteries. So um, this is work in collaboration of Peter Bruce, where we're looking at this garnet called lithium lanthanum zirconium oxide. And this forms these large micron sized particles and you can do the lithium NMR. And there's lots of people in the field who look at lithium NMR to look at the mobility in these compounds. Uh, but what we're doing is trying to make and look, look at the dendrite formation in them. And so you start off with a pellet with lithium metal on both sides. And this is the signal of the metal on both sides. This is the this is the um, the garnet signal, and we're looking at the at this direction. And when you short circuit, you can see the formation of these sort of lithium structures that are formed. And if you do a fib SEM, and this is work. Um, so Lauren did the the MRI. Stephanie and Peter's team did the fib SEM. You can see these um, lithium metal that is wrapping itself around these LSO particles. And of course it's destructive. And so if you want to sort of understand what's going on when you cycle it, you can actually do this with MRI. And this is a study where we're looking at different pellets cycled to different states of charge. And you can unpick things like, um, this is a one where you charge in one direction or, dis or pass current in one direction and you pass it in the other direction. There's a large over potential, but once you start to form these microstructures, the over potential decreases and that's because the lithium is sort of moving into the, the structure and the distance and the resistance is decreasing because the distance the lithium has to trans diffuse is actually going down. And then eventually when things are going really horribly wrong, you can see the dendrite that goes all across the cell. So um, just to say something about where we're going next, uh, what we're really excited by is some DNP measurements. So this is a technique called dynamic nuclear polarization. And this was actually proposed and invented um, back in the 50s. And the first application of this was on lithium metal. And so Albert o Overhauser predicted the so-called Overhauser effect. And most of chemists, we all know it in solution NMR and carbons and protons. And we've forgotten the fact that he actually proposed it for lithium metal and, and, and metals in general. 
And what he proposed was that you could take a metal, and so you can think about this as a, this is a sort of cartoon of an S metal where you've got ups and down electrons. You put them in the field and one goes up and one goes down. And this small imbalance between the ups and the downs, massively exaggerated here, is what's responsible for temperature independent paramagnetism. And now I apply a microwave and what that does is if I apply it strong enough, it equalizes the ups and the downs. And that you can see is a higher energy state and so that then can couple uh, via the hyperfine interaction with the nuclei to, and you cause cross relaxation that are going to enhance the, um, the, the polarization of the nuclei. So hyperpolarization means that it's larger than the polarization you would have in the field just caused by Boltzmann. And so um, Charlie Slichter and Tom Carver in 1953, so just the sort of almost the same year, actually showed this for the first time. So this is the lithium metal signal in the absence of a microwave. And then this is where he turns on the microwave power and they get an enhancement of 110. It's quite sort of difficult to know how they worked it out. I mean, they did other things to work out and predict why it was 110 because they can't actually see the signal without the enhancement. This is continuous wave, which is why you've got this sort of, um, uh, it's actually called a Dysonian line shape. And so what are we doing now? This is now modern. Uh, DNP, so we have a source in the microwaves. It could be in the most expensive form, a, a gyrotron. So we, we make microwaves, we send them down a transmission line and we put them into the NMR spectrometer and then we do NMR. And so this is the um, first lithium DNP of lithium dendrites in modern high fields. And you can see this is the signal with no microwaves and in red is when you put the microwaves in and you can see we have an enhancement of about a factor of eight. So, um, you know, in 70 years, um, we have reproduced the same experiment, but we have a lower, lower enhancement, and that's because we're at higher fields and it's much harder to saturate the ESR transition at these higher fields. Um, so that's nice. So it's very nice that we're able to reproduce Overhauser and Charlie Slichter's experiments. Um, but what's, what's nicer, and I think is more powerful about this experiment, is we are then able to use or to directly polarize the spins at the interface of the lithium metal and the SEI. So this is the signal of lithium six. This is diamagnetic, it's not the metal. This is the signal of the SEI. And um, you can see in blue is, is without and in red is with, and we can decompose that to, to actually look at the signals of the SEI at the interface between the lithium metal and the SEI itself. And we can do the protons and we can do the fluorine as well. And this is, these are experiments that we did just before lockdown. Um, and then, um, so that was nice. The paper was published and we're still waiting for the DNP. We're trying to buy one now. Hopefully it will be installed soon, but this is sort of, you know, that's where we're going, which I think is really exciting. If you can start to look at the metal and diamagnetic interfaces of buried interfaces, which is sort of one of the difficult things. Now, um, chair. I have been interrupted, um, which is great, um, but I have huh. also walked for an hour and a half. I can tell you about um, my redox flow, which is another 15 minutes, or we can wrap it up. Um, we can I'm, we can do it tomorrow. If, if you can start from there, is that possible, Claire? Per perfectly fine to start with that. I mean, I, 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 um, I know what's going to happen tomorrow is that we will run over as well. But... <laughs> Yeah, well, well, I think we, it's a good time to take a break and just take some questions and wrap up yep. today's session. Yep. So, um, so, so I let me, uh, let me then just um, let me just try and find a conclusion slide and, and thank the various people who've been, you know, so just to sort of conclude, I hope I've shown you lots of different things. I will show you more things tomorrow that NMR can be if you choose your systems right. Um, allow you to look at local structures and solve amorphous structures and poorly disordered structures and lithium mobility. And I think the two are very important parameters when you study batteries. And I've mentioned quite consistently all the people um, that have been involved in it. Um, so I will just leave this slide up. This was a picture of my group two years ago on a, on a, on a typical British summer. <laughs> um, but sadly, we haven't been able to do that for a couple of years. So thank you very much. I'll take questions. Thank you very much for the fantastic startup to these two, two lecture series. Um, I will now invite uh, people to ask questions. I have two questions, but let's, let, let us get the questions from students first. Yeah, yeah, Umit, you can unmute yourself and maybe hey, you can... Uh, you? Okay, uh, very nice talk. I, 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 I am a little bit outside of the battery field and I was wondering why potassium 
is not a is not a good candidate instead of uh, lithium in that plot it looked uh, quite promising uh, with a similar voltage and so on so i mean people people are looking at potassium but i mean the two things against potassium is uh, that uh, it's more reactive and so you know you really have to worry about potassium even just in terms of working with it in your lab uh, so sure. disposing of potassium is a nightmare. So leaving aside the safety aspects, which I think are significant, but are, you know there are a lot, there are a few groups that are starting to do potassium batteries, and I think you know maybe we can engineer away the safety. The other is a practical thing is that potassium is bigger, and so that means that the energy densities will come down because we're always we're often interested in how many how many electrons can we get per unit volume, and so the bigger the cation, the worse it is. And then um, the other thing we have to think about is um, the mobility of potassium. And so potassium does go into graphite and that's sort of the basis of the potassium battery would be to use graphite. But if you look at the anode side, um, sorry, the cathode side, then you're looking at layered compounds where the mobility isn't quite as fast. It's not too bad because you can still prop the layers apart and the potassium's move, but it's not as good as lithium. I think the sort of interesting question is why is it so good as, as in sodium? And I think sodium has a you know, similar mobilities in some structures to lithium. And that's by getting the sort of spacing right and getting the disorder right so that you still have um, places for the sodiums to hop to. But to cut a long story short, it's about the lower energy densities and about safety. Um, so, and you know, when you've got sodium, I mean, but I said, I don't want to under undervalue the work of a lot of very nice, very good groups doing very nice stuff in the field on potassium. But I, I sort of think you know, if you've got sodium as the next place, why not do that instead of potassium? But there may be reasons that I haven't thought about that, that make potassium more, more attractive in certain applications. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Um, uh, Prem, Prem Kumar. Yeah, yeah, I can. So, hi, Claire, how are you? Hi, hi, Prem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have one quick question regarding this uh, observation of what you say, this, uh, uh, the non equilibrium phases uh, people observe with layered oxide with the fast charging. Since you are working with the full cell, with all the, so do you, were you able to see this formation of phases or phase segregations uh, with, the, with your NMR? Uh, Yes, and um, it's not, so, we've not, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in my next talk tomorrow. I really want to focus on the sort of ideas of non-equilibrium and, um, but so that we've largely focused on with diffraction and also have some new optical experiments I wanted to show. Um, in the NMR, not so much in the in situ primarily. We, so we've done, we've looked at non-equilibrium processes in the silicon where we really okay. show that you see different pathways depending on charge and discharge. If you're talking about the layered compounds, we've not looked at it. Though I, I have to say we haven't looked at it with the care that we maybe should have for that problem. Partly because I think diffraction is is a better is a better way of doing that. Because when you're looking at the non-equilibrium phases, then that they're sort of bulk phases and we're sort of local structures. So we'd have to interpret our NMR in the context of the diffraction. But I, I will come back to that yeah, question tomorrow. Maybe we should have a more robust discussion when, when you've seen what, what I'm going to show, talk about. But thank you for the okay, question. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Aninda? Aninda? Yeah. Aninda? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Claire, I had a couple of, uh, well, one is a question, one is more of a comment. Um, uh, see, uh, when, when you were uh, discussing the lithium dendrite growth, so how critical are, well, I'm in the liquid electrolyte, uh, but how critical are the, the physical parameters of the liquid? Um, let's say, you know, yeah. Well, at the end of the day, you're looking at diffusion of the small lithium particles from the, uh, from the metal side to the cathode or whatever. So how critical are they? Uh, because people have tried to do many things on the material side. Uh, um, I mean, they're, they're critical in a number of different ways. And the, the sort of simplest one is that the diffusion coefficients of the anions and cations mm -hmm. uh, dictate, dictate the um, electric fields that you mm -hmm. form. And so you can go from regimes 
um, that are not diffusion limited to regimes that are diffusion limited. And in the diffusion limited, you have a really strong driving force to pull the dendrite out in the direction of the source of the lithium ions. Right. In the non-diffusion limited regimes, you still get sort of effects that I was talking about, um, this sort of space charge effects where you've got concentration build up um, or depletion at the electrolyte. And that's coming from um, the, the fact that the PF6 minus is flowing in one direction, not the other. And there you're dictated by actually the diffusion, the, the, the transport of the, the anions because the cations are sort of following that implicitly. And then you've got other phenomena whereby if you go towards an ionic liquid where you've got um, essentially the whole electrolyte is all either positive or negative. Yeah. You get much difference. You get very different screening of, of the um, fields that you get. And so the sort of simplest argument of why you don't get dendrites in an ionic liquid is that you get a screening of the fields over much shorter distances. But, but, there are other the, arguments that yeah, go down yeah. to also the nature of the SCI that forms in an ionic liquid versus a um, this is a conventional electrolyte. So, so absolutely. Um, and then, of course, the additives and the nature of the decomposition and the different things. But yeah, yeah. the thing is, of course, when one moves to ionic liquid, one also looks at very different kind of ionic species in the ionic liquids, which are not there in, let's say, a molecular solvent mm -hmm. system. So that is one very important change. So uh, actually, this is more of a comment than a question I see, you know, you have in the conclusion, magnesium, as well as in, in the table magnesium. So um, how close or how far are they for you to uh, probe from NMR point of view? Yeah, we've because done there the electrolyte is always a problem in the magnesium systems. Yeah. yeah, so we've done some work on magnesium and um, I was, you know, I'm hoping to put a little bit in the next talk. This next talk is sort of growing in scope and scale since I haven't given half of it, but... <laughs> We've done where we what we've done in the magnesium to date is we've done magnesium NMR. We haven't done in situ NMR because it's a lower. Um, it's just you need to enrich it basically, and it's quite expensive. Yeah. We've because, yeah. The, yeah, the unlike lithium or sodium, you know, magnesium does pull in a lot of uh, solvent molecules. During, yeah, yeah, and it's it, very like, especially exactly. if it is water. Uh, it's really, really interesting. Totally, and I think um, that's a very easy NMR experiment to do is to look at included um, solvent molecules. And you know, something we've done for the sodium case in hard carbons, if you've got the wrong electrolytes, you can pull in a lot of um, uh, ethylene carbonate molecules and glymes, and you can, you can tr watch that by NMR spectroscopy. Um, we've done a little bit of work on sort of the SCIs of magnesium. We've looked at magnesium bismuthides to, um, to look at that, and also some magnesium vanadium sulfide compounds. So magnesium NMR is, is there, it's, it's a little bit harder because it's less abundant, but in principle, it's not a, it's not a lot worse than, um, than either lithium or sodium. It's just, it's just low abundance basically and low frequency. So, um, so it's there because I am, um, yeah, because I have, in some of my talks, I have talked about magnesium. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for okay. the lecture. Yeah. Thank you, Aninda. Um, uh, so, Claire, I think um, uh, one question. Okay. Na, na, funny, you want to ask a question? Funny, you want to? Yeah. I, can I, I actually wanted to ask a question. If you want <laughs> can to I ask? We can, we can discuss later, actually. Can, yeah. yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just ask one question to her? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Claire, um, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, uh, could you just go back to your whole cell, like entire cell when you showed the NMR spectrum? Uh, that that the blue contour on the, the red peaks on it. I think it was um, few slides. Few slides. If you go, if you go uh, back, the whole battery oh, you put mean inside. The whole NFT one. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh gosh, now you get a little bit of a taste of redox flow. <laughs> yeah, that one. Yes, yeah, that's that. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah, perfect. Could you just? Just explain what you're uh, what you're seeing here, like the patterns and uh, just yeah, just from a very simple-minded perspective. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's it's not simple. I mean, it's Katarina's very clever and how she's doing things. But uh, so we're doing we we have NMC on one side and we've got graphite on the other side, but we're looking at the full battery. And so what we're trying to do is to pull apart the signal. So what you're seeing is the NMC signal. So I started off by saying it's a broad all right. 
and right. that's what you're seeing here. Okay. The signal at zero ppm is when you start is the electrolyte. So there's no lithium in the graphite. Okay. So this is just electrolyte. But then what she's doing is she's saying, because it's paramagnetic, the relaxation times are very fast. So you can pulse very fast. Yeah. So this is the signal when you pulse fast and that suppresses the electrolyte. When you do a longer recycle, then you pull out the more um, slower relaxing components. And so, um, so that's a longer relaxation time, emphasizing the, the, the component around there. And here we're now looking at the electrolyte and the formation of the graphite signals here. Okay, so this is just blowing up this region. This here. is the zooming up, zooming up the zero, the it, around PPM zero. Yeah, it, it's zooming, but using a longer relaxation. Time. Relaxation. Okay. Or, okay. Emphasizing the the longer relaxing components, and here we're emphasizing the shorter relaxing. Shorter components. relaxing components. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, this is published already, or yeah, it's in Jax. Okay. Cool. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Claire. I didn't want you to hold up any further. This is already two, almost close to two hours, but um, I'm happy to um, ask answer Fanny's question since I yes, I've yes, funny, it. funny. You had a question. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, so Claire, a terrific talk um, as always. Um, so one question that I had is uh, regarding solid state batteries. When you showed the dendrite uh, and the solid state electrolyte, right? It seemed to have the pattern of the grain structure of yeah. LZ. So it, it's almost like there are specific regions that lithium is preferring to grow. And, um, and so my question is a, a rather heuristic, I would say. Would you even call it a dendrite or do you think there are other mechanisms? Because when you call a dendrite, you are necessarily implying there are just concentration gradients that are driving the growth. But maybe okay. is there something else happening here? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. I mean, I, I, the question that you, the first question you have is how strongly fused were those particles? And so is it just finding the poorly fused particles? But it seems it seems very unlikely that they were so poorly fused that you're actually wrapping around the whole structure. Um, and I think that goes back to the whole question of what causes lithium dendrites in these dense ceramics that are densely sin sintered. And um, without you know, not answering your question, I, I still think the jury is out as to what actually causes dendrites because the question you have is lithium metal is quite soft and how does that um, force apart the, the LSO, which is you know, quite strongly fused together in well-centered centered pellets. I mean, there are cases where you clearly have um, defects and you have parts that aren't well-centered and so you can imagine it. And I think this is you know, something that I'm um, working on with colleagues in, in Cambridge to, to look at this and think about, but you know, there's various theories in, in the literature and we could go, we can go on about that, but you can imagine um, the sort of the argument of the, 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 the ivy that manages to get its way through anything, even though it's soft is one argument. And you could possibly argue that the flux of coming out of the, um, the LSZO particles is enough to, to, to ram the particles apart. I mean, I must admit what I'm trying to work out is the relationship between um, grain boundaries. And um, I've got a student, Sundeep, working on this project uh, who can talk more eloquently about this, but we're trying to look at what are the grain boundary occlusions? What is the chemical responsibility for why these things form? You know, there's a lot of issues with if you, your surface is not clean and you've got hot spots, which then give you much higher current densities in specific regions that undoubtedly cause it. And then there's, you know, there's, there's a work in the literature from the Oak Ridge group who believes it's electronic. I'm, I'm not sure that I totally agree with that unless there's a way of reducing the LSO under these high fields. So, so yes, good points. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think this, is where, uh, this is, is where the field concept? really is though. Pardon? Sorry. This is where the field really is, though, is to correct, really... Correct. Yeah. You know, so one, one quick follow-up regarding this point on electronic conduction. Do you see, uh, you've done an MR on this, do you see any random nucleation within the, the bulk of the electrolyte? Um, like all good studies, this was done by Lauren, and then she left to be an assistant professor in Columbia, and Sundeep um, Vema's his, his project to get this going, and we are still... You know, we are um, the world and the pandemic got in the way and you know, we're at the point of now trying to look for it. I, I would be honest, though, and say NMR is not a massively sensitive technique. So 
looking at the first initial nuclei is really tough, which is why, you know, I, I spent my time on this overhauser effect, because we're trying to look for ways of enhancing signal and maybe pick up some of the beginnings of, of the growth of the lithium. Because, you know, when you're starting to see the NMR, in many systems, the story is over. And it's really what do those first nuclei look like and how do you pick them up? And um, uh, the, the challenge, though, is, is in any study of a buried interface or a buried defect, that these, these things are just not easy to see. So you, you have to find ways where you maximize the number of nuclei or you see or you control it by appropriate pulsing to get more nuclei and then you grow them and then you can watch them once they've formed and then backtrack to the original phenomena. But you know, it's not desperately satisfying. So you know, this is why we're trying to push new ways to, um, well, I say new ways, let's be honest, <laughs> extremely old ways <laughs> to, to look at these problems. So um, um, it's because it's a real challenge. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot. You, unlike unlike a, a lithium metal liquid, you know, you can't go in with an optical method. You can't go in, even, and even the optical methods, they're not looking at the original nuclei. So, but in a, in a buried system where it's inside, you know, the only way to do it at the moment is to, is to be destructive. Although it's kind of interesting, you can get um, LSO that's so well sintered that um, you minimize the scattering from the interfaces and it almost becomes transparent. And then you can start to see the beginnings of these lithium um, dendrites inside the particles. But again, if you're seeing it optically, you know, you're hundreds of nanometers again. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you. Okay. Satish, you have any questions? Satish? Satish? Okay. Um, Claire, can you? I was on mute. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, it's been already very late now, almost two hours. Thank you very right. much. Beautiful, wonderful talk. I'm looking forward to listen to you tomorrow on Redox Flow Battery. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, Claire, thank you. Thank you very much for this. And um, I will take up uh, a question next in the next talk. There is one question in YouTube, but we'll take it up in the next talk and uh, we'll give you a break. Thank you very much for doing this, for sitting for two hours almost, or more than two hours. And uh, even when we had at least on my side, I apologize, the timing was one hour off. But um, thanks for, thanks for fixing that and being there for us. Thank you, Claire. It was, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all the audience as well, participating for this long and being active in, in asking questions and having this discussion. I hope you enjoyed, Claire. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. See, you, see you tomorrow. Yeah. Take Hopefully care. I'll see the audience tomorrow as well. Yes, <laughs> yes of course. <laughs> I haven't been put off. <laughs> uh, okay.